Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Goodwin. I'm a policy analyst at the National Center for Healthy Housing. Um, welcome to our webinar today on the EPA's um, lead and copper rule. This webinar is being hosted by the National Coalition for Safe and Healthy Housing. Um, the National Coalition for Safe and Healthy Housing is a coalition of over 600 members working to improve housing coalitions nationwide through outreach and education to key stakeholders and federal decision makers. Um, a couple of housekeeping items today. Um, if you have questions throughout the webinar, we're going to have um, hopefully plenty of time to talk about them. Um, so you can submit them through the chat box, um, and then our panelists will be able to see and respond to them um, for discussion. This webinar is also being recorded. Um, we'll be making the recording and slides available afterwards if you want to review or share with anyone else um, or miss, you know, miss part of the webinar. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator. Um, after a brief introduction. Um, so Nsaidu Obot Witherspoon is the Executive Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, where she organizes, leads, and manages policy, education, and training, and science-related programs. For the past 20 years, she has been a leader in the field of children's environmental health, uh, serving as a past member of the NIH Council of Councils on the Science Advisory Board for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the External Science Board for the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes NIH, NIH Research Work. She is a co-leader for Advancing the Science and Health Initiative of the National Collaborative on, cancer, um, on a Cancer-Free Economy Network, um, and is also a board member for the Pesticide Action Network of North America, the Environmental Integrity Project, and serves on the Maryland Children's Environmental Health Advisory Council. Um, so thanks so much for moderating, to, moderating today, and say, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the National Center for Healthy Homes uh, for this great in invitation. So we've got a, a great lineup here to talk about this very important topic of the lead and copper rule, and you've heard about me. We also will have Tom Meltner, who's the Chemical Policy Director for Environmental Defense Fund, and also Lindsay McCormick, who's the Program Manager of the Chemicals and Health Program at the Environmental Defense Fund. Next slide, please. So just for some basic background, we're going to get into just a little bit of some of the overall highlights of uh, the lead and copper rule, and then Tom will go get into much more of a deeper dive. Next slide, please. So why should uh, many of us, all of us, really care about this rule? It's extremely important. Just for background, I'm sure I'm not uh, surprising anyone here, but there are over 4 million dwellings in the U.S. that have lead-based paint, known lead-based paint. I would offer there may, that could be even higher, right? And lead dust hazards in our home to at least one child. So up to 6 to 10 million U.S. homes receive their drinking water from lead service lines. That's extremely important. I should mention that Lindsay, Tom, and myself are all steering committee members of an effort called the Lead Service Line Collaborative, Replacement Collaborative and also the Green Healthy Homes Initiative and the National Center for Healthy Homes are a few of the very important uh, broad, broader coalition members as well where we are trying to expedite the removal of lead service lines across the country. But until then, these unfortunate realities are uh, a huge challenge for us all to address. Uh, we know that children under the age of six are at highest risk of harm from lead exposure, and that includes prenatal exposure for sure. And we know that children of color and those from underserved communities have a disproportionately higher rate of exposure. So all children are important uh, and at risk here, but certainly there are children within the child health population that are even at higher risk. So these adverse health and developmental effects can be quite serious and irreversible with lifelong impacts to their well-being and development, and certainly think about the impact that this has on their educational journey moving forward. Next slide, please. So just as far as some general highlights, and uh, the caveat here is that we were given permissions, Tom was given permissions to utilize some existing EPA slides. So this is how they're presenting some of these highlights of the lead and copper rule. That this rule takes a pro is, is aimed to take a pro proactive and holistic approach to improving the current rule, looking at testing and treatment, and telling the public about the levels and the risk of lead in drinking water. And this rule, this proposed rule does require earlier action to reduce risk and better protect families from their perspective. 
and they are offering that it, that it includes efforts to improve transparency, communication, to help protect children from lead exposure in all environments where they spend the majority of their time. Next slide, please. So, of course, lead is not naturally found in water. Uh, this major route of exposure here through water comes from the leaching of lead from old lead pipes, faucets, and fixtures. The lead can actually dissolve into water and can actually enter as flakes or small particles, and that's the major route of exposure. In order to keep lead from entering the water, the EPA does require some systems to treat the water using certain chemicals that keep the lead in place called reduce, by reducing cor corrosion. And when corrosion control enough is not alone to control, uh, not sufficient to control the lead exposure, the EPA does require systems to educate the public about the risk of lead in drinking water and then to replace lead service lines. Next slide, please. So this proposed lead and copper rule maintains the current maximum contaminant level goal of zero and the action level of 15 parts per billion, but it requires a more comprehensive response at the action level and it introduces for the first time a trigger level of 10 parts per billion. The trigger level is a new flexible option designed to compel water systems to take progressive tailored actions to plan upgrades to aging infrastructure and to reduce levels of lead in drinking water. And this approach actually focuses on six key areas, which Tom will now uh, help provide an overview for. So the proposed revisions are in key areas, identifying areas most impacted, strengthening treatment requirements, replacing lead service lines, increasing sampling reliability, improving risk communication, and protecting children in schools. Next yeah, I, I've yep. got it here and say because I was on mute. <laughs> That's uh, okay. <laughs> Please uh, take it away. <laughs> so this is a pretty significant rule. We're talking about a cost of um, as much as a quarter billion dollars a year. Um, and it's a major change in how we go about protecting people from lead in drinking water. Um, it, there are many who don't think it goes far enough, um, but it is a step forward and I wanna go over those. So I'm, we're using EPA slides because I think they provide a good overview for it, but we wanna leave lots of time for questions. So feel free to put those chats in. I'm gonna cover the six key areas. Lindsay's gonna cover the childcare provisions. I suspect that's gonna be of real interest to a lot of people and the schools. And then I'll come back and go into a little more detail. But please weigh in with your questions. This is an important rule, but it's also a confusing rule, so getting your feedback is important. So let's talk about the key area one, and that is identifying the areas that are most impacted by it. So there's been some controversy in the past as to whether EPA had that, whether utilities, community water systems, had to have a full lead service line inventory they had to have enough so they could figure out where to do the sampling. Now they're gonna to have to have a full public lead service line inventory, so they need to know where they are, down to the address or a location, and they have to make that plan available to the public, and it needs to indicate not just where the lead service lines are, but where the unknowns are and where they are confident that it's not lead service line. So you can imagine in your communities as to whether you know where a lead-based paint is. This is, you know, a lot of times you're guessing and working at estimation. I think utilities are still gonna have to do that, use tools to be able to estimate it. So it's not gonna be perfect, but we're gonna have a sense of where all those are if this rule goes through thoroughly, and that'll be made public. And large utilities, those are serving over 100,000, have to make it available electronically. So we're gonna get, individual locations, that's the biggest part. And that information, especially if you couple it with lead-based paint, could be really game-changing for it. So let's look at the second area, and that is the treatment requirement. In essence, this is the corrosion control. This is the stuff that's designed to keep the lead in the pipe. Let's keep the lead in the brass, keep the lead in the solder that's in the system. So what they're going to do is have sampling, like they have currently, 
but they're going to have to reevaluate their corrosion control system to make sure that it's effective and they're going to have to have a plan for it if they find levels going higher. So the corrosion control can consist of pH adjustment, hydroxide treatment, but more likely it's going to be something more sophisticated in many communities like adding phosphates to the water that form a coating on the pipe. Those phosphates go a long way and we've really seen reductions with the original 1991 rule. But to get the next level of reductions given what we know out of lead, that we need to go a little bit further. There, I'll get to the section on small systems so that there's flexibility for them. So let's deal with number three. And this is one of the priorities from my perspective at EDF, and that is getting the lead service lines replaced. So currently we work with 15 parts per billion as a level at which after corrosion control isn't working, you say we need to start replacing lead service lines. And currently they have to do 7% a year once they hit that trigger. This new proposal reduces that from 7% a year to only 3%. Um, they don't really explain why they went to the lower level, so it's a rollback in that provision. However, because of other changes in the rule, a lot more utilities are going to be tripping the 15 parts per billion and likely up doing moving into lead service line replacement. But the more important part is that first bullet, and that is that the, there's set a trigger of 10 parts per billion. The trigger allows them to move, it says to the utility, you need to start replacing lead service lines, EPA assumed 2% a year, and you need to do the corrosion control, you need to do all the stuff so you're ready to go if you trip that 15 parts per billion. And I'd be remiss if I didn't let you know that neither of these numbers are health-based. The 15 parts per billion is all about corrosion control and the effectiveness of the system. 10 is just a lower number that EPA thought it could achieve. There's some calls for that number to be even lower. But a trigger is like getting the utility ready, starting it on that replacement, and if it continues to have higher levels, then it has to move faster. Again, though, it's only 7, 3% instead of the current 7%. Okay, so the next area is, uh, continuing on the lead service lines, is under the current rule, you can test out. Instead, instead of replacing a lead service line, you can sample the home, find that there isn't lead in that line today, and then not have to replace it. It can be tested out. That's going to stop. Also, um, if you're forced to do the lead service line replacement, Partial, you don't get credit for partial. It doesn't prohibit partial lead service lines, um, even though those increase short-term lead exposure, but it does say you're going to have to um, do, you only get credit for that 3% for full lead service lines replacement. Another key area, and you've probably encountered this in some of your communities, is sampling. A lot of the changes that we found in Flint and other areas was there was questions, ambiguity about the sampling. This rule locks that down. No more pre-stagnation flushing um, that you have to do the sampling in a more precise area. So it locks it into the rule and um, it says you're gonna only sample from homes with lead service lines. Currently you're only required to do half. So it makes the sampling more rigorous, more consistent, and it's of only those homes with lead service lines, unless you don't have any. So you're going to end up with a lot higher levels, would be the guess. The other one is risk communication. That's probably going to be important for all of you. The utilities have more specific responsibilities to reach out to public health departments, to reach out to community service providers, to reach out to pediatricians. And once a year, they also have to tell where the lead service lines are to every customer. So every customer will get a, lead, a notice if they have an unknown, if their line is unknown composition or it's a lead service line. And under the proposal, the notice, if you've got a lead service line, that annual notice has to go to all customer, consumers. And consumers are anybody who drinks that water to, to pass it through the lead pipe. So that's one of the big, big changes in this rule and it makes it pretty significant. 
The last area I want to highlight, this, this is from EPA slides, is protecting children in schools and childcare. Apparently they forgot that in the title. Um, but for the first time, systems will be required to test school and childcare facilities. Currently, only if the system operates a school or a childcare, which is uncommon, it's probably only 10% of the schools, do they have to do the testing. So now your community water system is going to be required to test um, and provide those results to the child care. I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, so she's the expert on that with us. So, Lindsay? Great. Thanks, Tom. So, before digging into EPA's proposal, I just want to give a brief lay of the land on testing at schools and child care today. So, next slide, please. So under the current lead and copper rule, the vast majority of schools and child care facilities do not have their water tested for lead. And based on the latest EPA analysis, that comes out to about 127,000 schools and 767,000 licensed child care facilities that are serviced by community water systems and not required to test. And then the one caveat to that is what Tom just mentioned a moment ago, um, is that educational facilities that are themselves public water systems, for example, because they're on a private well, do have to test. So in an effort to reach schools and child care is not covered by the lead and copper rule, EPA has a voluntary testing program called the three T's for reducing lead in drinking water. And aside from federal landscape, many states are adopting their own testing requirements, often relying on EPA's 3Ts toolkit as a guide to identify um, approaches. So today there are now uh, 15 states plus Washington, D.C. that require school lead and water testing and 11 states requiring testing in child care facilities. But these are very piecemeal and they have very different um, types of requirements that vary from state to state. So for a moment, I just want to mention that EDF has focused in particular on child care facilities as we've seen them as a critical gap with several challenges beyond the school context. So first, children under the age of six are more susceptible to the detrimental impacts of lead, with formula-fed uh, children at the highest risk. Second, there often isn't the same level of facility support at child care facilities, um, and they often don't have the same level of public accountability as public schools. And this is an even greater challenges for, challenge for unlicensed child care uh, facilities. And then third, small home-based child care facilities are more likely to have lead service lines, which are the largest source of lead when present um, than schools. And this is because lead is so heavy that the pipes were typically not made with a diameter larger than two inches. So facilities such as schools that are um, much larger typically don't have lead service lines, and we more frequently see them at the smaller facilities, um, such as home-based childcare, but also small school annexes. Next slide, please. So under EPA's proposed revisions, for the first time, all schools and licensed childcare facilities constructed prior to 2014 will have their water tested for lead. Specifically, the water utility would be responsible for uh, first compiling a list of schools and licensed child care uh, facilities that they service and verify that list every five years. They'd also be required to provide the facility with EPA's 3Ts toolkit as an educational resource. And then, of course, they would have to test at 20% of schools and licensed child care facilities every year until all facilities are tested within five years. And then this five-year cycle would repeat itself with each uh, facility being tested every five years. They'd also have to um, provide the sampling results to the facility as well as the local or state health department. And then finally, the states that already have testing requirements that are at least as stringent as those proposed under the lead and copper rule would be able to receive a waiver in order to avoid duplicative testing. Next slide, please. So while this is definitely a step in the right direction, there are some issues with the proposal that we want to briefly highlight here. So first, the rule proposes a very limited sampling protocol. Um, specifically, schools would have to sample only five drinking water outlets, while child care facilities would only have to test um, or have their water tested at two drinking water outlets. And you can see in the table here um, the number of uh, samples, and then on the right, the specific locations that the proposed rule requires testing be conducted at. 
So this is inconsistent with, three, uh, with EPA's own 3Ps guidance, um, which does require or suggest testing at all drinking water outlets, as well as the majority um, of state requirements that also require testing at all drinking water outlets. And because lead contamination is so localized, testing at just a few select locations may lead to a false sense of security, which is one concern with the proposal. Uh, second, it does not address lead service lines at educational facilities specifically. Uh, so it does not prioritize removal of lead service lines at schools and childcare, and it doesn't address the challenge of testing for lead when there's a lead service line present. So in an ideal world, the lead service line would be removed prior to testing specific outlets for lead contamination. And then third, the rule does not include any requirement to fix discovered lead problems. Um, so the proposal does not require either the uh, water utility or the school or child care facility to remediate lead when it is discovered. And to further complicate this, the proposal does not establish a lead level to trigger remediation in schools and childcare either. So essentially what this means is that the facility itself will be faced with the decision of when and how to take action based on the results they receive from the water utility. So at this point in time, um, I wanna pause um, and hand it back over to NSA to see if there are any um, broader questions before we move on with Tom's um, second half of his presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Lindsay and Tom. We see that a couple, at least three questions so far have come in. Please do use the chat box to uh, present your questions and we'll get through a few for now. And then if uh, time allows, we do have a couple more slides, but we definitely want this now to be some time for you all to engage on this important topic. Uh, so the first question is easy. Will the slides be shared? Yes, the slides and the recording will be shared after this uh, webinar. And actually, just as a quick plug, it's very important that you all please do fill out the evaluation of the webinar, which will pop up right away, right after you attempt to close out. Uh, so you can look for that as well. The second question from Peter is, what is the definition of lead service lines? Does this include galvanized iron pipe service line or a very definitive lead only line? Uh, Tom, would you like to address that one? I would love to address that one. And I will tell you, I can't be certain. Um, the rule defines lead service. So the current rule defines lead service lines as if any portion of that pipe is a lead pipe, unless it's just what's called a gooseneck or a pigtail. And that's where the first few feet of pipe that connects to the main and usually connects to steel pipe or galvanized down, downstream, that, that gives a little bit of the flex and when you're installing it in ongoing flexibility. So in the past, even though it had lead pipe in, it wasn't a lead service line. When EPA, in its proposed rule, although it's a circular definition, I think what they're saying is if it has galvanized on it, or if it had galvanized and still has a lead pipe, one of those goosenecks, those short pieces, then it is part of it, uh, is considered a lead service line. So I think they have expanded the definition of lead service line to include galvanized pipe, that is zinc-coated steel pipe, when it is downstream or was ever downstream of a, pig, a lead pigtail. Um, again, it's a little complicated. We've submitted comments already to try to ask FDA or EPA to clarify it. Next. Thank you very much. Yes, it is a bit complicated, but <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, another question is, what is the point of this if there's no remediation required? <laughs> um, would anyone like to weigh in on that? Lindsay? I sure, think you're I talking think about uh, the child care, right? Yeah, I, I, that's my understanding. Um, so, yes. my, um, so this is actually under the public education portion of the rule. And so while I cannot speak for EPA in indicating the point, uh, my, my understanding is that it's supposed to, um, or the intention is to increase awareness and um, provide um, the facilities with the tools to either um, 
decide how to address the lead discovered or conduct additional testing um, and to move forward. So while it's not required, I think the idea is that um, uh, you increase awareness on the issue and you um, get those facilities involved in thinking about the issue and maybe conducting additional testing um, or deciding to do any remedi remediation they deem they are able to do. But it is, um, it is a critical issue that we're commenting yeah. and thinking about. And, and just to provide a broader context on it, is this is really unprecedented for EPA to tell a community water system that you must sample all of these. It's not, um, current sampling is about getting a representative sampling, a hundred or so in the whole community, you know, for even for a large city. But this is saying you must sample every one over a five-year cycle. So it's a great deal of responsibility uh, for the utilities, and I think it's not it's not without controversy within the community water system and the water utility industry. But knowing it, allow the EPA, I think, is thinking if you know about it, you're going to act. One problem is, as Lindsay pointed out, they don't provide a trigger for remediation, so they don't even give you a benchmark with which to use to compare it. And so a lot of people are going to be using the 10 or 15 parts per billion, the 10 part per billion trigger, the 15 part per billion action level, which again have no bearing on health and have no real relationship to what a child care or a school can or should do. And other communities have set, uh, other states have set tighter standards than um, 10 or 15. And say? Thank you. Thank you. And Rebecca is wondering, just to confirm, so home-based child care will be covered, right? Lindsay? Yes, that's correct. But um, unlicensed <laughs> is not covered, and there's often overlap between the two. But yes, home-based will be covered. Yep. So it's based on the state licensing it, which means it's going to be changing from state. If the state doesn't do home-based, it doesn't license own base, it wouldn't be covered. But if it does, then it would be covered. So it's going to vary state to state. Yep, I'll jump down to Kristen. Kristen's asking, how do community water systems confirm if there is a lead service line? And um, many of us have been helping to advise EPA along this process, and that's something that we discussed a lot. Uh, it's my understanding that, you know, this, this is a, at times a challenge uh, for many water municipalities and, you know, many of these, uh, well, as you can uh, attain, these pipes are extremely old and the record keeping of them weren't exactly, you know, electronic uh, back when they, uh, many of them were used in a very frequent manner. So um, there's a variety of ways and even um, technologies that are being used to try to identify the pipe before actually doing digging. Uh, for many benefits, uh, but Tom, if you have any other um, thoughts on some of the technologies or the ways <laughs> that some of our water systems are trying to find these service lines, which is a challenge. Yeah, so that's a really good question, and it is one of the difficult parts of the rule. EPA doesn't indicate how much certainty you have to have, and clearly there's nothing in this rule that requires absolute certainty or actual testing. So. You know, in our comments at EDF, we said we should set a criteria like 90% confidence it's led if you're going to designate it as that. So utilities have a variety of ways of stuff doing it, like using records, um, like doing some in, uh, spot investigation. In some cases, they can do vacuum extraction where they go basically dig down with a water jet or a vacuum and look at the pipe. All of those tend to disturb the pipe, so that creates its own sense of problem. I don't think in this rule EPA is asking, if you look at the economic analysis, that there be absolute certainty. I think what they're asking for is that this is your best guess as to whether it's blood service lines, and they expect it to be annually updated. And just to give you an example of how difficult it can be, uh, one is to look at Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin said they had removed the last of the lead service lines in 2011, yet they found five more just in 2017. And they probably will find, continue to find them. So nothing is perfect. Since many people on the line are more familiar with the paint world, you know, how we have come up with the estimates of the numbers of paint or homes that have lead-based uh, lead paint hazards or lead-based paint 
the 36 million that have lead-based paints or the 24 million that have lead hazards, those are based on samples of uh, a representative sampling of just a few thousand homes that are predicted nationally. We actually have pretty good information on the number of lead service lines, but it applies to more like the 80-20 rule. Most utilities can tell you where they think they are, but they can't tell you with certainty. So making this information public, especially for large ones, making it available electronically, hopefully maps, will allow some feedback so they can continually refine that mapping. And say? Yes, thank you. There's a good catch here, and the question is, can you please describe how the changes in the lead and copper rule require an action level of 15, but no change at schools and child care facilities? And I would say that I, I have a variety of uh, uh, comments that I, that from the children's environmental health perspective, we do believe are positive for this rule, and this is where I would add is a definite challenge and, and not so well uh, covered. The rule does not set a trigger level for remediation in schools and child care facilities, and it does not mandate utility actions for remediation other than providing what's called the EPA's resource, the three T's guidance. Uh, they're just administering the test and providing the results, but there's no required follow-up or assistance, which is very concerning from a public health perspective. Uh, child care programs especially need more help, especially with understanding what their results mean. This is very new to them. Uh, we actually, as I said, had a, a meeting uh, three years ago of early learning and K-12 through leaders together in D.C. talking about lead prevention, and it was just very surprising to us that this was totally new frontier for them. So they really do require a lot of guidance, not just the results. What, do the, what, does, what do the results mean? Uh, guidance on what constitutes a level of concern or action on remediation, um, you know, so I, I, I know I also share that concern, and I see this as an unfortunate weakness of this proposed rule at this point. Anyone okay, else want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, no, I would echo all that. And then just to add a little bit um, onto that, um, so there, you know, under the current LCR, there is no requirement, right, um, for testing at schools and child care. So obviously there is no trigger level. Um, but, you know, the three T's um, toolkit that we have, um, theoretically, one might expect would have um, an action level to trigger action as well. Um, but um, when EPA updated that uh, toolkit in October 2018, so just about a year and a half ago, um, it went from a 20 parts per billion action level to no action level for schools and child care. And uh, the rationale for that, uh, at least to the best of our understanding, is that there's an understanding that there's no um, safe level of lead, and so it's challenging to put a number to it. Um, but then the reverse of that is it's really challenging to identify um, a point at which we need to take action without uh, a benchmark of sorts. So EPA essentially in their voluntary guidance went from 20 parts per billion, which was um, arbitrary and not based on health, uh, to no um, action level in its voluntary guidance, and instead is relying um, through that process on states and childcare facilities and schools to themselves identify what is an appropriate benchmark. And that works okay in some places where there actually are state um, requirements and they've identified their own um, action levels. So the facilities have um, a reference point. Um, but when you start applying that logic to the entire country, um, many of which don't have an established action level, um, or left in a situation in which schools and child care don't have um, a reference point um, to identify when to take action. Thank you, Lindsay. And then one other question here about child care. When would utilities start testing schools and child care if the rule were to become effective? Do you have a sense of that? You know, I, I'll have to defer to Tom because I, my understanding is the rule um, does not um, actually go into effect for several years after it's finalized, and I don't remember that number. Tom, can you so, fill in the blank there? Yeah, so so when EPA finalizes it, and they're anticipating it doing it later this year, um, then states are given three years to adopt that version, and they can make it more stringent. When a state adopts it, it becomes effective, so it's usually when the state, so it depends state by state adoption. 
Um, but in general, this rule looks at three years from the, from the effective date of the federal rule. There are a couple places where the state um, doesn't have the authority. I think actually almost every state has delegated authority. So there's going to be state by state variations on this one. Thanks, Tom. And also, could you repeat the definition of a community water system, please? So a community water system is, so there's different, so a public water system is one that has more than 15 connections or serves more than 25 people. Community water systems are what we often think of as, uh, as the municipal utility, the ones that are selling water. But you'll also have smaller public water systems that can that are also referred to as transient, like at a truck stop um, or non-transient, non-community. Um, uh, then there's different definitions. But generally, the utility when we talk about a community water system, it's the one you're going to be buying water from. It's the one you're going to be paying a water bill to. And there's about 50,000 community water systems. Yeah. Thank you. Another question is, would the findings have to be reported to families? And yes, when the utility finds elevated lead levels, they will need to notify homeowners within a 24-hour period and provide educational information regarding the best practices. So hopefully that's helpful. Getting some good questions yeah. here. Okay, who... Well, tell you yep. what, and say, let me go and just cover that part because it's so important to this audience. Um, sure. On the notifications, this is drilling into EPA's PowerPoint a little bit more. And that is, one is communications is the consumer confidence report. This is that email notice or that report that you get once a year in the mail, and it tells you the results of all sampling, not just about lead, but it's about pathogens, arsenic, everything. Um, and then the other one is a public notification that's sent to all customers if the water system has a violation of the treatment technique, so if they, if they have a problem. Um, exceeding the 15 is not a violation, though. So let me just move here. So the proposed changes, I wanted to get this, is they're going to revise the consumer confidence report so it's more clear, it's clearer what's in there, that water system who um, conduct, must conduct public notification to consumers within 24 hours if they exceed the action level. So that's what, the, that's what you just referred to and say. They also have to provide notices to customers whose individual sample goes above 15 within 24 hours. And I want to raise that's actually this difference than the first bullet or the second bullet. So the first bullet is when the 90th percentile exceeds 15, then everybody has to be notified. But the second one is you have to be notified in 24 hours if your home sample is over 15. It also requires lead service line, or systems with lead service lines to provide annual outreach. That's what I mentioned about the annual notice if you have a lead service line or an unknown service line. And that there's also additional public education to consumers. And then there's public access to the lead service line inventory. So a lot more going on here, a lot more specifics. Anything? Thank you very much. We're going to go into back to some of these questions here. Um, who is responsible for actually getting the schools and the child care uh, water tested, and is there a timeline? Lindsay? Yeah, so the responsibility does lie on the water utility or the community water system, um, but there are provisions. Um, that indicate that they don't have to be the one that specifically goes into the facility and collects um, collects the water sample. So that's somewhat akin to the um, the other monitoring under the rule, where um, it is the responsibility of the water utility to collect the samples, but homeowners are involved in the process. So um, that will remain to be seen whether we see um, the water utilities actually going into the facilities and, and conducting the testing them, or the sampling themselves, um, or whether the facilities will be involved in that process. Um, but then, of course, all the other elements of testing um, is the responsibility of of the water utility. So um, from you know identifying all of the facilities, um, setting up the sampling timeline. Um, 
actually um, analyzing the lead, uh, the sorry, analyzing the water sample for lead, um, that all of that falls onto the water utility. Did I miss the second half of that question? It was just, uh, and when, on what timeline? What timeline? So it's, um, it, the, the only indication of timeline that is, <coughs> sorry, provided in the rule is that every facility um, would essentially be tested every five years. Um, so within the first year, 20% of facilities are tested and then so on. And what kind of, what if a facility refuses or doesn't go play along? Oh, um, they, so if they explicitly um, indicate that they are unwilling to participate, then uh, the water utility can indicate, um, a, a, it, as part of their reporting requirements, can indicate that the facility refused. So there is that so option they have, as well. Yeah. So they have to provide the state. They have to. They have to provide the state with documentation. So it's more yeah. than just. Uh, oh yeah, I never heard back from them. Anything? Yep. Thank you. So Quinn asked, well, make the comment that the 3% lead service line replacement rate is estimated to delay full statewide replacement from 13 to 33 years. Does anyone with a legal background believe this is in violation of anti-backsliding laws? Definitely not a step forward. Um, Tom, you may want, I think you're our attorney on the, <laughs> on the phone if you have any comments, but this is definitely another area where um, I would say this is a um, unfortunate weakness of the proposed rule. Uh, currently, utilities have 15 years to replace 7% uh, each year, but the revised rule, as just stated, will give them 33 years, uh, replacing at 3%, so this is too slow. Many children are being exposed, obviously, in the meantime, and this may be slightly offset by the fact that all testing sites now need to be those with lead service lines, which means that more systems will show exceedance and therefore more actions will need to be taken, but overall this should not change the 7% replacement rate is, is my take on that. But as far as any uh, other law viola legal violations, Tom, do you have any other comments on that? Yeah, two thoughts. One is I will tell you what, what Lindsay and I on behalf of EDF think, and that is that lead service line replacement should never be a last resort, only when you have high levels. It should be every system doing it because the sampling system is not going to detect lead service lines particularly well. You're sampling the water that's not been setting in the lead service line. So the sampling system misses lead service lines and only if they're really a serious problem, a big problem. So we think everybody should be doing lead service line replacement now, not just at the end. That's EDF's position because we can't be another 25 years and still have communities, people drinking water out of a lead straw. So I'll step off my soapbox and say, I'm gonna give you EPA's perspective from the rule. And that is because of the more rigorous sampling that they've taken away the problems that may have been encountered with some of it, and also requiring that all samples be taken with homes with lead service lines, which are going to have higher levels of lead, just maybe not enough to trip the lead to the action level, that they feel that a lot more communities are going to be pushed into lead service line replacement. In addition, if you exceed the trigger level, that 10 parts per billion, then you also have to deal with some replacement that's negotiated at the state level. So they're arguing that, yes, we've reduced it from 7% to 3%, but the effectiveness will be a lot more service lines being fully replaced than we were getting under the current system. Anthony? Thank you very much. Dr. Kostnett actually uh, provides um, helpful background here to his question. I'm gonna to try to summarize, um, but basically the removal of lead service lines will not abate the risk, overall risk of sporadic release of lead particulate from downstream plumbing, including galvanized interior piping. So how will this proposed lead and copper rule alert residents to the hazards of particulate lead release that will continue even after lead service line replacement? Well, first, if it's galvanized, it would count that as a lead service line. 
I, I'm assuming that's what APA meant based on the language, but it, they have to clean up that. So if it's galvanized, it should be there and that would capture that particulate. It would not capture the particulate that might be formed from the lead solder or from the brass faucet. We're still going to have lead in drinking water. Lead is still going to be, lead is now. If you buy, go out and buy a faucet, there's added lead to a brass or bronze faucet today. So we're still going to have lead in drinking water. Lead service lines, removing them, including the galvanized portion, remove that significant source of the erratic exposure, but it won't solve all the problems. And there are cases in some communities, uh, one in Illinois in particular, where it does look like solder is the source. Um, so it, it's not going to solve all the problems, but drinking water through a lead straw is just a recipe for a problem, as we saw in Flint, Sebring, and Newark. That's it. Thank you. Daniel and Joy both kind of have a, a question I'm going to combine here, which is, you know, who bears the responsibility of the actual testing in the facility? Is it the, uh, in a child care facility, is it the facility itself or the water municipality? Um, so I, I think, pardon, sorry, Tom? You want to handle that, Lindsay? Sure. I think this is what I was trying to get previously, although maybe it wasn't 100% clear. Um, the responsibility of actually uh, of testing is the water utility, um, and they may be the one going in and collecting the samples. Um, but at least in the proposal, there are provis provisions that it would allow um, for others to collect the samples. Um, so it could be um, the facility support staff that are, that are the ones literally uh, collecting the water samples. Um, but the water utility, again, will be responsible for the other aspects of what is entailed with testing. And one of the concerns Thanks. the utilities raise on this one is that while schools have facility people, facility support people, as Lindsay said, a child care may not, plus it's a private entity. And if they think that they're, if they don't do the testing, the utility is required, which it is, they may just not want to do it and insist that the, the water utility come by at 8 o'clock at night and again at 5 a.m. and do the sampling. So I can tell you the utilities are concerned about it, but without that kind of requirement and no state mandate, we won't get the testing that is essential to reducing lead and drinking water at these child cares. Okay. Thank you. Joy, I think you raised, I mean, these are all excellent questions, but because this is rather new for the child care environment in particular, she asked, um, you know, we can pass lead, lead dust clearance tests in child occupied facilities and still have a hazard present. And we can have water test results exceeding trigger action levels and nothing is mandated to be done about it. Is the child care facility owner going to now bear the burden of the liability assumed? It's an excellent question. Uh, I will tell you, we run the Eco Healthy Child Care Program. Again, we've been training and educating folks, and many of them for the first time on lead, sadly. And uh, this is extremely of a concern that gets raised a lot um, as we're educating them and as they learn and as they actually test and uh, take the leadership in testing, whether it's dust sampling, water, uh, the like, they're very worried about what that now means for their small business and uh, what that means for maybe their inability economic-wise to, to remediate right away. Would anyone else like to speak on that question? Yeah, I'll join in. So think about lead-based paint. If somebody does dust wipe sampling in a child-occupied facility, a child care, there is no current requirement that they remediate. There's actually no requirement that there be any testing. So. What we're getting at this rule is we're getting the testing without a limit and no remediation. But for paint, we have no testing. We do have a limit if we did testing and no, and no required remediation. Um, the only trigger is if you do it, you have to, if you do abatement, you have to follow the abatement rules. Or if you do renovation, you have to follow the renovation, repair, and painting rule. So just to put that in context of the lead based paint requirements. And say? Thank you. 
And Rebecca asks, has anyone conducted an equity screen uh, to the rule? Any thoughts about ways the changes will improve or undermine equity? Well, I will just start. I, I'm not aware. I don't know if there's or, or to what levels uh, that was all handled. Uh, but I will say, again, as far as some of the weaknesses that we've been able to analyze on our side, the fact that we're not identifying lead service lines and child care facilities and prioritizing the replacement before testing the water is already a huge concern for me with a very vulnerable population like children. Um, some do believe that all children in child care facilities should be given water filters immediately before testing or anything else. Uh, but I, I, again, uh, I think there's um, a lot of discussion around all of that. And also, when testing, uh, we believe that we should be sampling at all taps uh, that are used for consumption in schools and child care facilities. Currently, the proposed rule looks at testing at only five taps in schools. So that's just another example for me. If we're going to get into this realm of where very young, vulnerable children spend a lot of their time, i.e. schools and child care, my personal opinion is we need to do this right so they're actually as protected as we possibly can get them um, at this level. Are there others that want to speak to other examples of equity or inequity or any type of equity analysis that you're aware of? Yeah. Yeah, and say I'll chime in on that. And I agree completely with you. Um, I'll reflect Ellen Tone here, where if you're going to go into the building and do sampling, you might as well do all the sampling. It's almost a waste just to cherry pick a few of those. So I agree completely with you. But buried in the document, uh, buried in the docket, is an analysis by EPA of the environmental justice implications of this rule, which means the in impact on low income and minority communities. And normally that's a pro forma thing, everything's fine. But they actually did some pretty interesting stuff on this. They said that because low income residents and minority residents are more likely to have lead service lines, they think the current rule already has a disproportionate impact. Because of the corrosion control, they think the rule will reduce the overall disproportionate impact on those communities. However, because they're still allowing partials to be done, and they're happening every day in every community as they rehab a service line or as they rehab a main under the street or there's emergency repairs, the agency said, as long as you're expecting customers and property owners to pay for the replacement, low income and to, and to related extent, the minority are not going to be able to pay for that. And as a result, there's going to be a disproportionate impact on this community. And that's in the docket. We've looked at that at EDF and we've done some studies, which we'll be talking about in the coming weeks, to document and, and show through hard evidence in, in, in the community that that's exactly what happened. That if you ask customers to pay, those without the money, and those who are more likely to be minority, are not going to, are going to get partials and then be exposed to higher levels of lead than they would be if they had gotten a full. So we think the rule um, aggravates it for those customers that are getting partial, um, even if the net impact might be positive. Answer? Yep, and I would just add as far as serious environmental justice implications, utilities are required to replace their public side of the lead service lines when, when a consumer is willing to replace their private side. So again, if you don't have the economics, uh, if you're not in that position to do that, then that again uh, can uh, already you know creates a huge buffer and barrier, I should say, to you getting the type of protections you would need and want for your family. Right. Okay. So, well, if, so I there's all, that, there's all, if I could weigh in, yep. there's one other provision in the rule that says that if a customer wants to replace their line on the private side and pay for it, then the utility must replace it on the on the public side within 45 days. And I'm there's not always this division. I'm just using public and private side as a as a quick way to describe it. There is a concern that I have, um, and that you know utilities have, is that who's going to pay for it, who's going to do the volunteer, who's going to volunteer to have those replaced are going to be developers, they're going to be people selling their home, they're going to be people with the money. So that also may aggravate that environmental justice concern. 
Thank you. And we're down to our last two minutes. We'll do our best here to, to get some in. Uh, will renters be notified about the implications to this, relate to this rule? Yes, they will be notified if they're drinking water through a lead service line. They will get an annual okay. notice. And it could be posted yeah. in the common area, much like the notice that you get in the uh, paint. But that is a, an interesting and fascinating provision that goes far beyond what's already done. Yep. Thank you. And then a lot of, well, all of our, majority of our conversation has been focused on the lead service side. The question is, what about the copper part of this lead and copper rule? Are there aspects that we'd want to draw out in the last 90 seconds or so? Well, that's what corrosion control is supposed to be about. The corrosion control is to try to reduce the amount of lead that's going to leach from that copper, which copper doesn't have lead in it, but the solder that may be there. So we're relying on corrosion control to really do that. Um, there are some concerns that the sampling being so biased to lead service line may miss a potential problem with a copper line if that solder is somehow uniquely vulnerable. And that it's occurred in some communities. So that, that is a, a potential issue that I know folks are commenting on. Thank you. And one final question, uh, Lindsay. If a water system finds a lead violation at a school or child care facility and then notifies the school district officials, are those school and district officials mandated to alert their parents uh, and teachers and, and community members affiliated? Um, so, yeah, so briefly, um, again, there is no uh, sort of equivalent of a violation since there's no action level or action level equivalent set. Um, and then in terms of communicating to the facility, uh, sorry, to the uh, parents, that falls to the facility. Um, so again, they're given this, essentially all the utility has to do is give them the results, give them EPA's three T's voluntary guidance, um, and then the facility will do with it what, what um, they will. So uh, within that guidance, there are templates and information on how to communicate with parents. So the idea is they would take on that responsibility. Yep. Thank you. Um, and we will see if there's a way for us to uh, address the additional questions and maybe send them around to you all. I've seen where that can happen. We'll see if this system allows for that. Uh, Tom, can we go to the final slide, please? Yes. Let me do that now. There again is going to be an evaluation of this webinar. We really do encourage you to complete that. And then as far as next steps here, um, there, the pre-publication version and other materials related to this proposal are at, found at that, that link there. There is a 60-day comment period of following publication. There is an opportunity still to submit your comments. We highly encourage you to do so. Uh, the more comments, the better, and a lot of you raise important concerns that we all share. And uh, there will be review and, a, and a, an evaluation of the public comments, and then finally implementation with uh, any related revisions in uh, later 2020 is at least the proposed and, timeline so far. Oh, and yep. one quick quick clarification, EPA has extended the comment period, so it's February 12th. Yep. You have to comment by February 12th. Thank you. I want to thank Lindsay, Tom, National Center for Healthy Homes, and, and all of you for your time. This clearly was a very uh, 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 important topic of interest, and it's extremely important, I think, for all of us to do what we can to weigh in and let the EPA know that we are, you know, watching, we're reading, uh, and, and sharing and uplifting the various public health and other related provisions that we would only hope and expect are found uh, to be implemented into this new revision of this, of this rule. So thank you all very much. Yeah, and thank you so much for uh, moderating it. Thanks.